you would uh, find your seat here, we are going to begin our equipping hour this morning. It's great, great to be with you all. Give you a minute to find a seat and uh, just want to give you a little roadmap of where we're going uh, in equipping hour the next several weeks. I'm going to be with you this week and next week and just an opportunity to share just some things that I've been working through, uh, some things that have been on my heart. Uh, next week we're going to work through, I've, in the student ministries we've been looking at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, looking at marriage. So there's just a, a lot of things that they're on my heart that I'd love to share with adults. We've been talking about it with students, so just some applications next week. Uh, but this week, you know, an opportunity really to just to work through a passage that's been an encouragement uh, to me. So I'm just going to, I'm going to preach at you a little bit. We're going to be in Luke 17. And then in October, there's going to be a, a five-week series, the, the five solas of the Reformation. Uh, so we're going to work through those five, uh, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, the glory of God alone, and in, in Christ alone. So that should be a really good series for the month of October. Uh, but today we're going to be uh, Luke 17. So let me, uh, let me open our time in prayer, and then we will dive in. Lord Jesus, we love you. Uh, we thank you that you are king, that you are a, a good king, that you are a merciful king. Uh, we thank you that you love sinners, and you love to save sinners. So just thank you that you have saved the, the saints that gather this morning in this room uh, the saints that will be here uh, at 1015 during our service. I pray that uh, today would be uh, an act of worship, uh, that we would sing with thankfulness in our hearts, that we would listen with thankfulness, Lord, that we would uh, let your truth, your word rule over us, and that we would uh, walk away more like you, more um, devoted to you, that our love for you would grow, and that the love for, for others in this church, the love for the lost would grow as a result of, of what we do this morning. So we pray all these things, Jesus, uh, in your name. Amen. Well, I like to, to think about some passages of Scripture like uh, close friends, friends that walk with you in life. Uh, the passage we're going to look at this morning is, has been a friend to me. I think of it like uh, just friends that, that help you navigate hard situations, friends that take you by the hand, uh, friends that build you up, and this passage has been a, been a friend to me. And I actually remember the, the first time, this, so we're going to be Luke 17, verses 7 through 10. And I remember re- reading this passage, you do your Bible reading and you read through a passage, but the first time that I really remember diving into this passage was actually uh, Scott Demarest. I remember him uh, working through this, I think it was in a, in a chapel that we had, a TES chapel probably five years ago, and, and I remember him talking about just the impact that this passage had on his own life and on his own thinking, and just on his, his daily habits. So at that point, I just remember thinking, all right, I've got I to gotta know this passage. I've got to start thinking about this passage. Uh, so since then, it's, it's been uh, just something I've come back to regularly, had an opportunity to share this with our, our young adults uh, about a month or two ago, and so just excited to work through it uh, together. And the, and the reason this is such a good passage, just an important passage, is because it's just so comprehensive uh, in its scope. Comprehensive because it speaks to so many areas of life. I mean, this passage will help you deal with discontentment. It will help quiet a complaining heart. It will help cultivate thankfulness in your heart. Uh, If you embrace this passage, you will be a a better parent, a better worker, a better student. Uh, This passage will fuel body life in the church. This passage will help you deal with conflict. And if you embrace this passage, if the church embraces this passage, it would produce a an army of humble servants, eager to, to serve King Jesus. And it's comprehensive in its scope because it, it gives us an attitude for all of life, an attitude that we should take with us each day, a daily disposition we should have as we think about our ministry in the church, as we think about our job, as we think about our parenting, as we think about our schoolwork, as we think about relationships with others. And it starts, though, with uh, thinking rightly about ourselves and thinking rightly about the Lord. So would you read with me Luke, Luke 17 with all of that buildup? This passage is just such a, a wonderful encouragement to us. So let's read Luke 17, verses 7 through 10, just a, a short parable from Jesus. Verse 7, Jesus says, Which of you, having a slave, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat? 
and properly clothe yourselves and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done. And this simple parable of Jesus is about entitlement. It gives us tools to battle entitlement. Entitlement meaning to, to make demands in your heart, make demands of the Lord, make demands of other people. We say of unappreciated, unappreciative children, we say they are entitled. And what we're saying is that they're acting like they're owed something. They're acting like they deserve something that they, that they haven't achieved. And entitlement is, is self-righteousness. It's a self-righteous idea that thinks because I have done this and this, God owes me something. You know, my situation should change because I've done this. And maybe your initial thought is, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm that entitled. Well, let me, let me give you some realms just to think about, some areas to consider. The first area is just in relationships. Just think about how entitlement can creep into relationships. Just a couple questions to consider. In your own life, how, how do you respond when someone mistreats you? How do you respond when someone lets you down? How do you respond when someone's not thoughtful of you? Do you hold grudges? Are you slow to forgive? Do you stew on offenses? Do you get upset when you're not appreciated? Or maybe envious when you see others achieve success that you don't have? Do you ever say, woe is me? Do you ever, do you ever pity yourself? Entitlement comes out any time that you think you deserve something that you're not getting. When people don't act in a way that we think we deserve, we, we have earned a right to be treated this way. I recently heard this definition of, of discontentment. I think it's really helpful. It says, discontentment is the difference between expectation and reality. That's, that's where discontentment lies. The difference between what you expect and what actually happens. And entitlement comes from a place of wrong expectations. We demand something from God. We act like God owes us something. Like he is obligated to us. And others around us are obligated to us. So entitlement is a merit-based view of God. To think God owes me something because of what I have done. And this shows up even in our, our service in the church. This can show up. This monster entitlement. When we keep track of things we have done, we start to keep tally marks of all the ways that I've served. We keep, we keep an agenda of all the, all the things that I've done behind the scenes that no one saw. And slowly in our heart, we make demands. You start to think, I'm owed something. We start to limit our service. I will do this one last time, but no more. We start to compare ourselves to others. Maybe we measure ourselves to others in their service. Maybe we measure our weaknesses to others. Well, I don't struggle with that, so I'm doing better than them. Maybe even justify our weaknesses. And we might even have this stepping stone mentality where we start to think, you know, I've done this and I've done this. I don't have to do that work again. I don't have to do those menial tasks. I've already been there. I'm past that. And you see, entitlement robs you of thankfulness. It's going to rob you of your joy in the Lord. It's going to cripple your ability to sacrificially serve others. And it's going to suffocate our, our service in the church, our service to the Lord. And it's a, an anti-grace mindset. You know, grace is unmerited favor. You know, we, we have not been given what, we've de what we deserve. God has given us grace. So to understand God's grace is to say, I don't deserve anything from God. All I've received is mercy. All I've received is kindness. And I'm thankful just to be employed in the service of Christ. And we think about just how entitlement affects our service in the church, how it affects you. If you were to, just to answer the question, you know, what's going to hinder most your service in the church, your ability to, to minister to one another? We think about ministry in the church, oftentimes we think about official maybe positions. You know, you're in the sound booth, a, a, a position of service. But you think about ministry in the church, it's service of one another, life-on-life -life ministry, encouraging others toward Christ-likeness. And think about how entitlement would just rob you of ministry in the church because your biggest obstacle to ministry is actually yourself. 
It's you. Because we so often want to be served. We want to be appreciated. We want some kind of esteem or recognition. We can be so quick to look out for our own interests. And that's going to rob us of a heart that wants to serve Christ and a heart, a heart that wants to serve others. So my goal this morning is to, to help us together crush entitlement, to, to root it out in our hearts, so that we can be freed up to be humble servants, humble servants of Christ, uh, exercising our gifts, our abilities, uh, focus on the head of the church, Jesus Christ, so that he would get credit, not us. So that he would get glory. He would be magnified, not us. And as we think about entitlement, you know, this monster entitlement, putting off. What do, what do we put on? What's, the, what's the, the other virtue? You know, put off entitlement. Put on what? What's the opposite of entitlement? If you think about entitlement as, as thinking that God owes you something, well, the opposite of, of that would be to say, I'm, I'm a debtor. In a word, Humility. Entitlement, you see, is, is pride. It's a, it's a proud disposition to, to overvalue yourself, to overvalue your, your gifts, your abilities, your contributions. The opposite of that is humility. You know, pride thinks highly of our own efforts, of our labor, thinks I have earned some right. I have earned some privileges. I can start making demands. And the fundamental difference between a, a believer and a non-believer is how they view themselves. That is the fundamental difference. How they view themselves and, and how they view the Lord. The unbeliever is categorically proud. And the believer has been humbled. The unbeliever thinks that God is in his service. He thinks that God owes him something. The unbeliever thinks that God should smile favorably upon him. He is proud of his own thinking, his own activities, his own actions, the, the good things he thinks he has done. But the believer sees himself as a debtor, as obligated, sees that he brings nothing to the table. He has earned nothing before God. He humbles himself before God's assessment of him. And we talk about humility. What, what we mean is to, to see God rightly and to see yourself rightly. That is humility, to have a right view of yourself because you have a right view of God. You remember Isaiah 6, when Isaiah is ushered into the throne room of heaven, and he sees God. He says, holy, holy, holy. Right? This throne room in, in heaven, this scene. What is Isaiah's response? He says, woe is me. He sees the holiness of God and he sees himself rightly. He says, I am unclean. I am unworthy. So Luke 17, this passage, it levels our pride because it paints a, an accurate picture of who we are. We are slaves. You see it in this passage. We are bondservants of the Lord. We have the lowliest position. We are not, nothing is obligated to us. We are obligated. We are debtors. And I love how Jesus sets up this passage. It's a little bit like, uh, you remember Nathan the prophet when he comes to David. He tells David this, this parable. He tells him this story about the rich man who took the one sheep of the poor man. And you remember the, the punch of, the, of that passage. Nathan says to David, you are the man. Well, here in this passage, similarly, Jesus sets up the parable in verse 7. You know, which of you, being a master, you know, find yourself in the position of master. And then you get to verse 10, and what does he do? He flips the, the script. You are not actually the master here. You are the slave. You must find yourself in the position of a slave. And this is the, the attitude that we must go after. This is the mindset that's going to fuel our service in the body of Christ. It is this right thinking that we are slaves of Christ that we are debtors, that we are not owed anything. This will crush entitlement. So let's work through the, the story uh, briefly, and then I'll make some, uh, just some implications for us. And, and like any, any parable of Jesus, he uses uh, an illustration, a, a common illustration, things that, that people would see around them to illustrate a, a truth, right? something that they would see in daily life. So they, they would see in daily life a, a master and a slave, this is a common experience. You know, for us, it might be something common. You think about a, a barista. All of us know what a barista is, what they do. All of us have been to a coffee shop. He's just using a, a common illustration, a master and a slave relationship. And I think it's helpful just to, as we start, just to explain uh, just slavery. You hear that word, slave, and there's a lot of weight. There's a lot of baggage in that word. And I think it's helpful just to, to give a quick, not, a, not an in-depth history lesson, 
but just to helpfully explain so that we're, not, we're able to hear the story rightly. That we don't confuse you know, our, our view of, of American slavery, the evils, the horrors of the American slave trade, and, and try to equate that with what Jesus is saying here. Those two things are not equal. What made the American slave trade evil, for one, was it, it was kidnapping, it was man-stealing, forcing people against their will. will. I mean, you read about the stories, the, the slave ships, all of the evils that went on, and also the, the evil of treating people like they were not human, savagely treating them, beating, mistreating, over and over again. This was godless. This was immoral. So we should not equate, when we read this about a slave, we should not equate all of that baggage here. This is a different kind of slavery. Surely in the New Testament, there were masters who mistreated slaves. There's even kidnapping because Paul actually has to prohibit man-stealing. Don't do this. But I don't think we should read, as we read about a slave here, I don't think we should read all of that in here. Just say this is a common role in society, a master and a slave. In the Mosaic Law, there are regulations around slavery. Uh, Indentured servitude. You know, someone that owes a debt they can't pay back. And they actually might willingly subject themselves to slavery to pay back this debt for a season. Bring their family under the the house of a master to work. This was an agreement, an expectation between both parties. And you think about Israel, just this agrarian society, uh, farmers having a field, growing their own food. So if you don't have a land, if you don't have any other skill, you know, there's not homeless shelters, there's not food pantries, you know, there's not, there's not a welfare society like we have. So the, the slavery here is actually helpful for people that have no other means, have no other options, to actually subject themselves into slavery. And yes, grueling work, hard work, thankless, and it could be abused, certainly. But what's in view in this passage is this general expectation of a, of a master and a slave, an agreement between the two. You, know, you have your responsibilities and I have my responsibilities. The master is responsible for the estate. The slave responsible for his duties on the estate. In this scenario, Luke 17, probably a small estate. The slave has work to do out in the field. And he has work to do inside. That is his obligation, the, the price that he must pay to receive the benefits of, of this household. So as you read the story, just remember the slave here is not being mistreated. He's not being abused. He gets to eat, but he has to fulfill his responsibilities. So Jesus here is just referring to this common cultural pe- practice, really to help us understand expectations, attitudes, to remind them, all of you understand the attitude of a slave and the attitude of a master. All of you understand what is expected by both parties. You know, to be a slave was fundamentally to be subject to the will of another. That's what's in view in slavery. You are subjecting yourself to the will of another. A slave does not get to decide what you do, when you do it, how you do it. The master decides. You obey. So Jesus uses this picture to help us, to help his disciples think rightly about ourselves. That we are subject to the will of a master. And we can jump right to the punchline, verse 10. This is where he's going. You see it there. He's saying, so you too. You have this mindset. Have this disposition of a slave. Implication here, tell your own heart. Say this to your own soul. Remind yourself of this truth. This is what our hearts must say. I am unworthy. This is what Jesus is driving at. I don't don't have an outline for you on the screen. Pretty pretty simple uh, structure here for this passage. Just uh, we're we're battling entitlement. You could, uh, to say it positively, cultivating an attitude of humility. How do you cultivate humility? Well, here there's a a pathway that Jesus gives. And it comes down to, to two things. How you view your work, how you view your duties, your obligations, and then how you view yourself. Just think about that framework as you're reading this. In order to be humble, you must see your responsibilities rightly and you must see yourself rightly. You must see yourself as a slave. And you must view your work, your ministry, your labor, whatever your hand finds to do. You must, you must do that in light of this reality that you are a servant of Jesus Christ. So verses 7 through 9 are the, the story, like I said, and then verse 10 is the punchline. So verse 7 He says, which of you, ask this rhetorical question, which of you having a slave, after he has done his work, he's out in the field, 
When he has come in, which, will you say, which of you will say, come and sit down and eat, recline? He, he sets the, the stage as the expectation of a master first. If you were a master, you have property, you have land, you have responsibilities, you have an inheritance maybe, you have your honor tied up in this, you're supporting your own family. So you as a master, what would be your expectation of a slave in his daily work? In this scenario, verse 7, telling the slave to sit down and eat, to relax. He's saying this would never happen. This is a rhetorical question. That does not happen in the master-slave relationship. The slave here seems to be responsible for the, the farming duties. Out in the field, shepherding the sheep, working out on the farm. That's his task during the day. And at night, he's responsible for the inside the house affairs, making food. So daytime in the field, nighttime in the home. And verse 7 is saying he wouldn't do half of his job. He wouldn't work outside and the master say, take the rest of the day off. You've earned it. I'll take it from here. No, verse 8. He will not say that. Obviously, he would not say that. Will he not say to him in verse 8, prepare something for me to eat and drink. Prepare yourself and serve me. Afterward, you may eat and drink. You, know, you still have work to do. He's not depriving the slave of food. Right? He's not even treating him unkindly. He's just saying, you have a job. Do your job, and then you can take a break. That's just the, the type of relationship. These are the expectations. You know, we have similar expectations. We think about employment. There are expectations. We understand there are responsibilities that you have. You don't get paid unless you do these responsibilities. You know, imagine that you make $25 an hour and you work an eight-hour eight shift. You know, your workplace is open from nine to five. So eight-hour shift, $25 an hour, you make $200 a day. All right, and you're responsible to be there for your entire shift. All right, so to imagine now a scenario where your manager would say, hey, you've worked four hours. It was one o'clock, go home. Take the rest of the day off, and you're still gonna get paid $200. No, that, that would be a foreign concept. All right, we have to staff this place until it closes. We have customers. You know, the manager says, I only have a $200 budget. I have to fill this, this slot until you leave. That would be foreign. You only did half the work. You only get half the pay. Or imagine going to a restaurant with a waiter. I, I used to be a waiter. And sometimes it, it does seem like waiters are treated like bond servants. Not, not treated very well. But, but what, what expectation? Who would have an expectation to come to a restaurant and to say to the, to the server, come sit down and eat with us? No, 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 don't, don't get us food. Sit down, have a drink hang out with us. No, you're, you're going there to have a dinner. They're doing their job. They're bringing out the food. The slave here doesn't do half the job. Hey, come inside. Watch Monday Night Football with me. No, he says you need to finish your job. He has a responsibility. He's indebted. The, the master isn't indebted to him. He is indebted to the master. And similarly, verse 9, he's moving from the, the work of the slave to his, his position, what he expects from the master. Another rhetorical question in verse 9. Verse 9, he says, He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? And you shouldn't read thank like, okay, the, the master really needs to be more polite. You know, to say please and thank you. And you think about what's just common etiquette. You know, you say thank you and he says my pleasure. You know, that's how they do it at Chick-fil-A, so it must be right. But that's not, that's not what's in view here. It's not, a, it's not a matter of politeness. He's saying to say thank you. This is to, to give him special honor. He's not saying you're, you're going to receive some special honor. You're going to receive a, a bonus here. Thank you for, for doing your work. Let me give you a reward for your service. Because he did the, the bare minimum. You know, if you're just a satisfactory employee, you don't, you don't get promoted. A friend this week is talking about his workplace and how they do promotions and pay raises. And he talked about these structures of you know, the top 10% performers. And then you have the next maybe 20% performers. You know, here's the, the pay scale. And then the 70% that are left, that's a satisfactory job. And they're not going to get the same, the same pay increase. They're not going to get the same promotions. Well, here, the, the slave, he's in the 70%. He's saying, you just have done your job. You shouldn't expect a promotion. Again, this is just about expectations. The servant is indebted to the master, not the other way around. He's just doing what, what is his duty. I was remembering uh, just a situation growing up with me and my brother. I think I was probably 14 years old, if I remember right. I think he was 15. And uh, we wanted to shoot hoops, basketball, in, in the front yard. And the car was blocking the, the driveway. It was blocking the basketball hoop. My parents were, were gone. So he says, hey, I'll just grab the keys. I'll move the car. They're, they're not going to mind. 
and then, uh, and then what happens is he ends up running through the, the neighbor's retaining wall, just smashes their wall, you know, so then my parents get home. <laughs> there's a lot, of, a lot of explaining to do. And, uh, and just think about that situation. You know, there's a, there's a, a consequence where, hey, you gotta, you gotta pay for that, that wall. You gotta fix it. And, and you're, you're grounded for, for a week. I don't know, I don't remember what the consequence was, but there's, you know, you gotta, you gotta fix your mistake and, you, and you're grounded. There's a, a consequence. You know, my parents wouldn't have said to him after he fixed the wall, okay, the wall's fixed, good job, you're not grounded anymore, you did the right thing. No, that was his obligation to fix the wall. You know, the, the punishment, you, you made a mistake, you have to own your mistake. The, the slave here is doing his duty. He doesn't get some kind of preferred treatment. The listener should hear this and say, of course the master wouldn't treat the, treat the slave this way. Of course not. And by implication, the slave shouldn't expect it any other way. And this is where the, the indictment starts. The, you are the man. You know, disciples, you are the slave. This is you. He's pushing us to this attitude. To, to be a, a humble servant in service of the master. Verse 10, he says, you too, or you could say you also. Just like the expectation of a master and a slave, that must be your expectation. To say you are bound to the will of Christ. You are bound to the will of another. You are his disciples, his servants, and you are under obligation to him. This is how you must see yourself. This is humility. To see yourself as a slave, as indebted, as undeserving. So we have these, these two aspects here, cultivating this attitude of humility. A pathway, you could call it a pathway toward humility, to, to view your duties rightly and to view yourself rightly. View your duties, view your obligations, your responsibilities rightly, and, and secondly, to view yourself rightly. So your, your duties, what you ought to have done, he says. All of these commands of the Lord in verse 10, when you do all the things which are commanded, to say these are only our duties. We are obligated to do those. There's a, an assumption here that the, the slave has indeed embraced the work of the master, that he has come under subjugation to him. The master has dominion. So everything commanded is, is seen as a duty in service of the master. And we live in a society that wants no obligations, no duties. You know, no one wants to pay back their student loan debt. You know, I signed this, I covenanted, that I would pay this back, and now I don't want to pay it back. And it's actually unfair of you to ask me to pay it back. That's the society we live in. I, I saw this stat about uh, marriage rates. In the 1970s, the marriage rate was 76%. They measure somehow the eligible age of people, how many of them are married, 76%. Uh, today, 31%. You know, I want all of the benefits of marriage without any of the obligations. And worse than that, you think about abortion. I want, I want all the benefits of sexual intimacy with no consequences for my actions. I don't want to take responsibility. And this is our hearts apart from Christ. We, we rail against authority. We rail against obligations. We rail against being told what to do. And the slave here is primarily one under authority, doing the will of the master. That is what it means to be a Christian. You are under the authority of Christ. And so the mindset here is to view yourself as under obligation. And we can find out pretty quickly how humble we are. If you want to know how humble you are, how, how do you do with your responsibilities? How do you do with the, the obligations that Jesus puts on you, the duties that you have? The humble one recognizes Jesus' lordship, and they embrace all that he has commanded. And Jesus says, this is in verse 7, this is a foreign statement, to do half the work and take a break. No slave would do that. No master would expect that. To do half a job and then kick your feet up. To watch TV, to say, I've earned, I've earned a break. And then I just think about how often I've done this. Dads, how often you get home from work. I've worked a long day. I've earned a break. I've earned some me time. And this is my time to relax. And you read this, this parable. You think, hey, are, are you not the, the slave who worked half a day? You worked out in the field, but what about your duties at night? What about the influence on your home? What about your obligation to, to parent and to instruct? You know, this, this entitlement creeps in. And we say, no I, no, I deserve a break. I've earned a break. 
and you see the, the self-righteousness come out, right? Now, I'm, I'm owed something, a merit-based view of God. I have earned something. I have a right to enjoy myself. And this happens, moms, in the same way, maybe not out loud, but in your heart. You know, I've done all of this work day in and day out, and no one notices, and no one appreciates, and no one says thank you. And there's nothing ungodly with being discouraged. But then what do you do with that discouragement? You know, the moment the the self-pity creeps in, the woe is me, this mindset that, that subtly says, it's not fair. That is entitlement. Because you have to ask yourself, what were you doing the work for? Who were you working for? Were you doing it for recognition? Were you doing it with some kind of expectation in return? Or were you doing it simply as humble service to Jesus? I'm a slave, eagerly embracing the duties you've given me. And even if people don't appreciate, he sees, he knows, he rewards. And just consider all of the the duties that you have, all of the the obligations that you have. Uh, Obligations in, in the workplace, Obligations in school, if you're in school. Uh, In the home, obviously, uh, parent obligations, dads, to protect, to provide, to lead your family, to nurture and cherish your wife, parents to instruct and discipline your children. At church, we have obligations to one another. You have obligations in, in positions of leadership that you have. We have obligations with our finances, with our time, to be stewards of all the resources God has given us. There's a stewardship of the the giftedness you have in the body of Christ for the sake of service. So how are you doing it, maximizing all of these things in service of the Lord? When we don't work hard, when we don't own responsibilities, when we aren't concerned with what God has entrusted to us, we are saying in our heart, never out loud, but in our heart, it doesn't really matter. You are saying, God, I know better than you. Or maybe more, more crassly, just to, just to acknowledge that my comfort, God, is more important than your commands. And if you are apathetic, if you don't steward well your responsibility, if you don't even care, I just want to spend time serving my own needs. In those moments, you are not recognizing that you are a slave of Christ. If you're not acknowledging that God expects something from you, you're acting like, I don't give an account for those things. You're acting like you get to pick and choose what you think is best. When God has told us, he does care. It does matter. We don't, we don't choose. We're created. We're not sovereign. And the bare minimum expectation is that you would obey. That's the bare minimum. That's not the top 10% of performers. That's the satisfactory. That's just the, the minimum, to do what the king of heaven asks you. That is the expectation, your duty. I mean, a lazy worker in the workplace does not reflect an attitude that he is employed in the service of King Jesus. He he does not demonstrate that he views himself as indebted. The indebted servant says, I'm going to be the hardest worker. I'm going to have the best attitude because I serve a different master. And to embrace your duties, your obligations, your responsibilities is to embrace uh, Jesus' lordship, his authority, to embrace where he has placed you in life today. So often, we, we imagine, well, in this next season, if something would change, if there was a, a better job, a better situation, then I could work harder. Once I find that job I love, then I'll, then I'll be diligent. You know, once I find that relationship I want, then I can be more content. You know, once I move to this house, have this vacation, have this much in, the, in my bank account, then, you know, once this person changes, then I can treat them well. Or once I get out of this season of life, then I could serve the Lord freely. And that is a a sure recipe for discontentment. Because we have expectations that are unmet. We start to demand things in our heart. And that is not the attitude of of a servant. A servant attitude embraces whatever responsibility, whatever situation you are in today, wherever God has placed you in this moment. I love this quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, It's the mark of a grown up man as compared with a callow youth, that he finds his center of gravity wherever he happens to be at the moment. And however much he longs for the object of his desire, it cannot prevent him from staying at his post and doing his duty. See, that is a mark of maturity. It doesn't matter what I want to do. I've been obligated to do these things, so I'm going to do them. 
So this is the, the expectation, that you would embrace all that is commanded of you. Embrace your current situation. Embrace your duties. Embrace Christ's lordship. You are under his dominion. All tasks are for him. All tasks are under his gaze. In verse 10, when he says, after you have done everything commanded, that is the the baseline expectation. And we have to ask the question of ourselves, when is the last time this happened? You know, you read that statement in, in verse 10. When you do all the things which are commanded, just this assumption. Of course, the slave does everything he's commanded. And we ask, wait, when have I ever done that? When have I gone a day with doing everything that the Lord has commanded? He's saying, if, if you had done everything, if you had obeyed perfectly, you should say we are unworthy slaves. That's just the, the basics. You know, if you never lied, never were angry, never discontent, never complained, if you were the, the perfect father and husband, even then, you say we are unworthy slaves. I'll turn real quick to the, the last paragraph of your Bible, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, I guess the last, maybe the last page of your Bible, but Revelation 22, verse 8. I just love this picture here that John gives us uh, at the end of Revelation, the, the messenger, this angel who is giving him a message. Verse 7 and 8, he says, Revelation 22, And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of this prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And look what the angel says in verse 9. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant. Same word, a fellow slave of yours and of your brethren and the prophets and those who heed the words of this book. Worship God. You can turn back to Luke 17, but you think about the, the angels in heaven who have never obeyed, 6,000 years, perfect, without sin. And what does the angel say to John? He says, I am an unworthy slave, like you, only doing my duty. That's what the angels in heaven say. We are fellow slaves. So if the, the angels are indebted to God in that way, how much more the redeemed? How much more those who have experienced the, the grace and the mercy of God? And back to this pathway to humility. The first I said the area considers to think rightly about your work. The one who, who works for the master. But, but the one who does this work is still not free from this entrapment, this entitlement, even after you have done the work. Once you are in the master's service, you could do all these things and you could forget. You could start to, to build up. Look what I've done for you, Lord. Look what I've done in your service. I've earned some special favor. So there's a danger here to do all these things and then to be puffed up. So the pathway to humility, first, to view your work rightly, and two, to view yourself rightly. At the end of verse 10, after you have done everything, after you have obeyed, if you had obeyed perfectly, you still must say, we are unworthy slaves. Unworthy. This is humility. A right view of God and a right view of self. Now the word unworthy here, not to say worthless, you know, all of us, uh, in a sense of value, I mean, all of us created in God's image. So we want to say there's, there's no value there, no created in God's image. Everyone has a, a value in that regard. When he's saying worthless, he's saying you don't hold a position of honor. You are not deserving, you could say. This is the opposite of entitlement. Like in verse 9, when he says the, the master does not say thank you. He does not give you a seat, at honor, a seat of honor. You are unworthy. You are, you are the lowest position. The entitled one says, I am worthy. I have earned this. And the unworthy one says, no, I I am indebted. I'm not owed anything, but I owe a debt. I'm obligated to God as creator. I'm obligated to God as savior. To echo Paul's words, "What, what do I have that I haven't received? What do you have that you haven't received? We are all debtors. And we often remind our kids, you know, you are in the home. Under our authority, you don't, you don't get to make the rules. You don't get to pick what food you eat. You don't get to pick what we do with our time. We, we actually get to, to tell you. you know, we provide, so we get to decide what we eat. And it's easy to talk about kids, but then we actually do that with ourselves, right? We start to, to make those same demands of the Lord. We have to remind ourselves we are not in charge. Jesus is the, the head of the body, the church. The church goes after his pursuits, 
his purposes. And the attitude of humility doesn't say, look what I've done for you, Lord. Look at my service. It just says, I want to be used by you in whatever way that you would have me. I want to see your kingdom expand. I want to see your gospel go forth. I want to see your church edified and strengthened. I want to see saints encouraged. Not holding tightly to to what's my role. What do I get to do? But just saying, Jesus, I want to do whatever you would have me do. That's going to maximize my influence for your sake, for your kingdom. If there's someone that's better equipped for this task, let them do it. Let them get the credit. The attitude of a slave says, I don't need a position of honor. I want Jesus Christ to receive honor. This is uh, Paul's mentality. Remember when he says that he's the one who casts the seed? He said, basically, I don't, I don't care if Apollos gets the credit. I don't care if Peter gets the credit. You know, we are just fellow laborers. We're just casting seed. And God causes the growth anyway. What if the church embraced that attitude? Unconcerned with who gets credit. Unconcerned with accolades or recognition. I just want, I just want God to grow his people. I want his word to sound forth. I just want to be useful. Uh, one of my favorite books is the biography of Martin Lloyd-Jones by Ian Murray. A two-volume biography. And uh, Ian Murray, if you don't know, well, Martin Lloyd-Jones is a preacher in the 1900s. A Westminster Chapel in London, one of the, the most famous preachers in the 1900s. Ian Murray uh, served under him. Wrote his biography, was uh, his mentee uh, in Westminster Chapel. So Ian Murray documents the end of Martin Lloyd-Jones' life. The, really the last conversation I think they have together is, as Martin Lloyd-Jones is stuck in his house, bedridden, no longer preaching, no longer doing any ministry. And I just love the, the account that Ian Murray gives of this last meeting. And he writes, I saw him, that is Martin Lloyd-Jones, then in July of 1980. When I arrived in his room, he had a text. It was a text for me. This is a text of scripture. And a text he had obviously been preaching to himself. Luke 10. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. In this, said our Lord, rejoice not, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The lesson of this text, he said, is that, is that if we are living upon what we do, if our happiness is based upon our preaching or our service for Christ, there is something deeply wrong with it. Not in this, says our Lord, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The ultimate test of a preacher is what he feels like when he cannot preach. It is a real snare for the preacher to live upon preaching. And Martin Lloyd-Jones goes on to say, People say to me now, it must be very sad for you not to be able to preach. Not at all, he would reply. I was not living upon preaching. That is to say, I was living for Christ. I'm just thankful to be employed in his service. I just want to get into the kingdom. Whatever capacity he would have for me, in our flesh, our indwelling sin, this this corruption that clings to us, it screams so often, what about me? We easily take offense, easily disgruntled, get annoyed with people so easily. And we even take good opportunities for service in the church and make them about us. We take our jobs and say, how much can I make for me? How can I build my own little little pyramid here, my own little empire of significance. And that's all pride. That's all a high view of self. I heard uh, Pastor Richard Caldwell in Houston give this definition of pride. He said, pride is when the creature stands up when he should be sitting down. The creature stands up when he should be sitting down. I love just thinking about, this med's been in Revelation 5. You have this throne room scene in heaven. You know, at the center is Jesus, the lamb on the throne. And just imagining someone standing up in that scene and saying, look at me. And that's what we do. That's what we do when we use our gifts, our abilities to say, no, I want, I want, to be, I want people to look at me. I want them to recognize me. I want to draw attention to me. What we should be doing is saying, look at Christ. The gospel produces humility. It produces a heart that agrees with God. It sees God as as God and us as servants. Not just uh, acting humble, but being humble in the heart. Not just putting on a a posture, but actually embracing this truth. After uh, our summer camp this summer with the the student ministries, I remember being asked several times, you know, how did camp go? 
man, thank you, thank you guys for doing what you do. And, and I remember answering several times, yeah, it's a privilege. It is a privilege to, to get to serve in this way. And I said that, and I meant it, but then afterward, I, I was thinking, you know, did, did I actually embrace that? When it was two in the morning, and there's the second kid in a row getting up, I'm looking at Alex DeShields, he's there, you know, there's two in the morning, and it's like, all right, we just try to go back to bed, you know, am I in that moment saying, Lord, this is a privilege? You know, it's easy to say it. I can answer the question that way, but in that moment, am I saying, it is a privilege to be in your service? It is a privilege to, to do whatever I can do to serve your church? Or are these just words that we say in response? That truly humble people are the most eager to serve. Those who see themselves as slaves to Christ, they see it as a privilege, indeed a privilege to serve. And this mindset is so critical. Imagine a church where everyone embraces this mindset. I just want to be most useful to the Lord. No demands on my service, no expectations. I just want to be about the business of my master and his purposes. I want to see Christ's name go to the nations. I want to see his glory manifested in Tempe. I want to see his word sound forth in this city. Imagine a church that everyone is gripped by that truth and what the Lord could do with a, with a people who embrace that reality. Psalm 84.10, I'd rather be a, a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Just to embrace that mindset. I don't care what position. The lowest, lowest position I just want to be part of God's family. And as we talk about this attitude of entitlement, we talk about being slaves of Christ. Uh, you know, we could start to imagine that this, this joyless service, you take a hammer and say, you need to submit to Christ. And it becomes this obligation. And it becomes this burden. And, that, and that's, not the, that's not the idea here. This is not burdensome. I want you to turn to, to John chapter 8. As we think about being slaves to Christ, to think rightly. Turn to John 8, verse 34. In this passage, Jesus talks about slavery, two kinds of slavery. John 8, starting in verse 34. Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. There are two masters in view in that passage. There is the, the master sin, slavery to sin. You know, all of us before Christ were slaves to, to this entitlement mindset. Slaves to thinking only about ourselves. And in Christ, we have freedom. Jesus says, you will be free indeed. You will be free from this attitude that says, me, me, me. You will be free from thinking so much about yourself. You will be free in Christ. You are slaves of righteousness. We have a new master, a good master. Jesus says to put my yoke upon you because I am gentle and humble in spirit. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is not drudgery to be in the king's service. This is freedom. This is life. And I talked earlier about the, the punchline of this passage. You know, the, the plot twist. You know, that at the end, you are the man, you are the, the slave. But I think more shocking than that, a bigger plot twist in this story. You know, verse 7, he says this contrary statement, a master would never do this with a slave. This is uh, nonsensical. No master would say, sit down and recline with me. That never happens. And this is exactly what Christ does with his people. Listen to Revelation 17. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Picture in Revelation this feast. The saints who are clothed in white, who have been purchased, who have a righteousness that's not their own, dining at the table of the master. He says no master would do this. No one has ever heard of such a master. And this is exactly what Christ does. And he rewards us. He gives us a seat of honor. 
the work that he gave us, that he prepared for us, that he empowered us to do. He rewards us for it. In Christ, we have all the privileges, not of slaves, but as sons and daughters, part of God's own family. And we get this position of honor, not because of anything we have done, not because of our works, not because we obeyed perfectly, none of us. Obviously, the the wages we earn, the payment we should have received is death. But we receive eternal life, reward. This is the master that we serve. No master would do this, and yet this is what Christ does. And even more than that, more than just saying, come, sit at my table. You know what Philippians 2 says? More than just inviting us, it says, Jesus took on the very form of a slave. Same word, this doulos word. He took on the form of a slave. He became a slave. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. I mean, that should smash any entitlement that we have. That should produce thankfulness in our hearts. So this week, as you battle for for thankfulness, as you battle to serve without expectation, as you battle to to not hold grudges, whatever whatever issues you're facing, whatever struggles of discontentment, whatever relational conflict you have, look to Christ. Look to this one who became a slave. Look to him. And let me, let me close our time just in prayer and just, just ask the Lord that this church, Grace Bible Church, we would be a people marked by humble service, servants of King Jesus, the, the master who himself became a slave. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you are worthy of worship. You are worthy of all praise. You are highly exalted. You are Jesus first became a slave. You humbled yourself. You became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And you didn't stay dead. You rose. You are seated in victory in heaven. So I pray that this week, our our minds and our hearts would focus Jesus on you, seated in victory in heaven. That you would produce thankfulness in our hearts. That you would produce in this church humble servants who this week would say, Jesus, you are worthy of worship. You are worthy of our service. You are a good master. We would embrace whatever duties we have, whatever responsibilities we have. We would do those with joy and eagerness, just eager to be in your service, eager to be in your family. And I pray that a watching world would see these things, Jesus, and that your name would be magnified in this city, in this place. We love you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.